Um, so first, I'll, I'll say uh, a little bit of my background. Yeah, I have a huge passion for disadvantaged populations. Um, and, you know, when Aaron, I heard you say, what makes chronic pain fun? So what makes it fun for me um, is that folks that are, are suffering in chronic pain are suffering. Um, and I think for any of us that are burned out, you know, it's, it's one thing to be burned out in a job. It's another thing to be in pain on a daily basis. And our patients hurt. Um, a lot. And, and I loved that graphic earlier today of that pie chart where you saw it. It's really the, the patient's job to manage that pain and we're this tiny little sliver. So for me, it, it makes me get up in my job and say, stand up and do my tiny little part for them um, in, in that big world of suffering that they're dealing with um, on a regular basis. Uh, you know, a lot. A, another piece to keep in mind is that a lot of our folks suffering with chronic pain, um, they're people of color, they're, they're people that are poor, um, there are people with low resources for various reasons, rural. Um, you know, we need to keep that in mind when we're talking about how we're going to reach them with all these systems. And I know a lot of us in here are working really hard trying to think about um, the state of Washington and what we're going to do to try to reach these, these folks. So I just want to infuse a little passion um, in the group today um, it, or transfer a little bit of mine in that way, um, you know, if, if you're open to, to having more, because I know a lot of us have already a lot of that. I, I want to give you uh, somebody, one of my, my patients that's in my heart. Um, you know, I, I attended our pain clinic for seven years. I co-treated lots of patients with Mark Sullivan, David Taubin, Judy Turner. Um, wonderful patients. And I had one that was from California, and I think she exemplifies a, a lot of what we see, where she arrived up in Washington, and she had a morphine equivalent dose of, you know, I don't know, 250, give or take, um, and, you know, kind of a train wreck case. And she comes in, and, and her cognitions are pretty low. Um, you know, she, she sort of looks like she's not very functional. She's on disability at this point. Um, you know, and, and uh, she winds up, of course, in front of me as a psychologist. And, and I do this assessment of her. And I realized that our pain team didn't know that two years ago, she was pulling in $10,000 a year um, in an executive position. And a month. I'm sorry, a month. Thank you, Michael. I told you this story at lunch. See, that's why you're, you're here keeping me honest. $10,000 a month in her salary. This is not how she presented in clinic. And I think for a lot of us, when we see these patients who come to us, we're, you know, you're often, as a primary care provider, not the one who put them on that level of medication. They kind of arrive in that way. And the psychosocial pieces that happen to a person's life are really important to capture. And it's near impossible for these primary care providers to do that or for our pain physicians to do that in the little bit of time they have to assess all of this. So, you know, I think collaborative care and what we're talking about today, and when I talk to you today about what we're what we're doing with um, the Department of Labor and Industries to try to, to push this out um, is trying to build that capacity to get that psychosocial picture filled out for these patients so that we can treat them in, in the patient-centric way that they need. Other way. Thank you. All right, so, you know, this, this was a graph that was shown to me um, in, in the early days of working with the Department of Labor and Industries um, a, a couple years back now. They've been doing a, a really extensive um, planning uh, phase, a couple phases, actually, of trying to roll out this new program. And this disability curve is really striking. Um, you know, I think Gary's mentioned this a few times, you know, where you see folks that are really at high risk for long-term disability, uh, you know, within these, these first few few months and weeks really here of, of time loss um, after an injury on the job. And so the idea here is what can we do better in this curve in these first few weeks to really help these folks not wind up on this on this lower trajectory. So, so there's some intention here for us to um, potentially address things in the early curve, but I want to keep this real. And there are lots of folks that are injured on the job also who have been injured multiple times. There are lots of folks who come who on their injury in their first claim already have chronic pain when they're walking in. So we don't really know just because they're in those first few weeks of a claim that that's the curve that they're on. Um, so when we're thinking about collaborative care, we have to think about the whole population and the whole cycle of chronic pain and, and health um, that, that might be going on with these patients. Um, the target population we, we've stated really clearly is that we want these injured workers um, to have, have pain um, and some sort of behavioral health risk. Uh, issue that puts them at risk for time loss and disability over time um, with this intention of prevention of long-term disability. Keeping in mind, though, that there are a lot of um, conditions that they might have comorbidly that are, are difficult to prevent or things like depression, anxiety that are going to be cyclic and coming back over and over over time. 
Um, we want to address this gap for injured workers right now. There isn't really a, a, a systematic way that these folks get into care. There isn't a systematic way that any of these patients get into care, whether they're an injured worker or not, frankly. Um, and I think it would be such a neat thing for LNI to be leading um, in, in putting a program like this together. Targeting engagement in treatment early in their claim process is also really important. I've treated many LNI patients that have been on LNI for many years. Um, and any of us who have done that know there, there is a very unique signature to these patients um, in how they interact with that system of care that's very painful to be a part of as a provider as well. And it's really great for us to think about how we can turn that around and make that a healthy uh, relationship. So we really want to do brief targeted treatment and step up care as needed. You guys have been hearing tons about that. I'm going to give you some detailing on, on what the planning for this program looks like, and we're hoping to start this program um, rolling out in the next year. Um, and, of course, using evidence-based, team-based care as we go. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because you heard um, Jurgen did a, a fabulous job, I think, going over this, and, and several others have touched on it. Um, but just making sure that you're all aware of the program we're talking about adapting here is collaborative care. Um, and, I'm, and my goal today really is to give you um, a bit more of a detailed sense of what exactly does that look like. We've talked a lot about it in principle. I've heard a lot of the talks give you know sort of high level and what the principles are. I want to get a little more down to the nitty-gritty of what does that really look like um, and what some of our challenges are. Um, and recommendations are, because again, I know many of us out here today are, are trying to think about what can we do moving forward. Um, there are these five principles of collaborative care. Um, won't, I won't go over all these, so this is making it easier for me to have fewer slides today, um, since this has been touched so many different times. It is really important to take these principles and operationalize them in really concrete ways, so that's the reason you see the little subtext underneath each of these. Um, but keep that in mind, if you're thinking about moving forward with collaborative care in some way, you wanna make sure uh, you know, that you're operationalizing each of these principles and potentially trying to measure those. Um, I love the question that Leah has asked me all along the way is how do, I, how do I know that I'm paying for this? How do I know as a payer that we're actually getting this type of care? Um, which means we have to be able to measure it. Um, I want to go over just a little bit of a difference here that, that is sort of on the undercurrent of what we're talking about. Um, and these really are the di differences in traditional treatment format um, of what you typically see whether, you, whether or not you've got somebody co-located as a behavioral health provider, meaning a psychotherapist. Okay, many of us have psychotherapists that are co-located in our clinics. Um, and, and I want to go over a bit of the difference between what is collaborative care, where you've got that behavioral health provider doing collaborative care, versus when you've got somebody who's doing psychotherapy sitting in the clinic, um, or who is, who's outside that you're referring to doing psychotherapy. So the left side is, is what um, the workforce, many of us were trained to do as psychotherapists, which is, you know, you're that single behavioral health expert. Um, we do good assessments. We assess, you know, very targeted problem. Um, our training is typically pretty costly. We're usually at least master's or doctorate level folks. Um, we have, uh, when we're doing evidence-based treatments, you know, fairly rigid protocols for how we're doing that, although there's also the flip side of that where you get people that are eclectic who are, you know, not necessarily following manualized treatments. Um, you've got limited population generalizability, meaning, you know, you just see who gets sent to you and that's it. There's no control over um, who's getting sent to you uh, from a population perspective in any kind of way. Um, they're time consuming typically. Um, a lot of private practice folks are very incented to keep seeing patients perpetually. Um, and it's really common for me in the pain clinic to have seen patients who were getting seen for years by the same therapist and not necessarily when I ask them bluntly, is it helping, saying yes to that question, right? Um, but that's what the, the providers in their defense are incented to do. That's, that's what a lot of insurance companies support. Um, and, you know, frankly, they're feeling bad sort of disengaging that patient when they've got nothing else to go to, right? Um, the, the point of care um, in, includes doing treatment only when the person is face-to-face -face with you. Um, there isn't typically time in that kind of a practice to do a lot of outreach and say, hmm, I wonder why Susie hasn't shown up for the last um, few appointments. Rather, there are these policies that say you don't show for three times, guess what, you're fired, and I don't see you anymore, right? So, so there's no outreach built into that. Um, and again, I can't underscore more this limited population reach for this kind of treatment for all these reasons. Um, collaborative care is quite different than that, where you've got a care manager um, and who also works in conjunction in, in this particular model of integrated care with specialist consultants um, weekly. And I'll talk to you more about that and how, how we're wanting to um, adopt the, the specialist role um, for LNI and injured workers in chronic pain. 
Um, there's sy systematic screening that's typically done. A lot of private practice um, clinicians are getting better at this. There's a shift in the field, so I don't want to downplay that, um, that that's not happening over in traditional care. But in collaborative care, that's an imperative. There has to be some kind of um, screening that's happening in measurement-based care. Um, brief evidence-based treatments are typically the focus, so it, it's, it's in stated um, goal that we will not have long-term patients um, on these caseloads necessarily. Not that that doesn't occasionally happen, but the goal is definitely to try to have briefer episodes of care with the idea that if someone's not getting better in three to six months, um, then we need to step up care and do something different that isn't keeping them sitting there kind of going through the same motions. We have interdisciplinary team care happening within these. There's an explicit goal to actually talk with the other um, providers that are on the team, whether it's a primary care provider or other specialists involved in that patient's care. Um, so it's not something that's just kind of solo done in isolation and where you're expecting the patient to hold the bag on telling you what's happening with other providers, if that's even important to them or not to tell you about, but rather there's this explicit, we're all going to talk together and share a care plan um, that's patient-centric and all commit to that. Um, medication management is something that these folks do. Um, in treatment as usual with psychotherapists, you get varying levels of folks that have varying levels of knowledge about medications um, and how they potentially might be affecting the patient. In collaborative care, there's a very tight connection between an expectation that the care managers are going to do medication adherence related work. Um, they also have consultation weekly with providers who prescribe, psychiatrists who have that kind of expertise that can also help advise them in that um, as well. There's telehealth um, to, to reach these patients. There's, there's, there's a flexible stance as well that's really important that this kind of role has, um, whereas treatment as usual, it, it doesn't really matter if you're flexible or rigid. You can sort of practice however you practice and that's what you offer. Care managers need to be very, very flexible. Um, and I want to give a shout out. There's Mary Curran is here. Can you raise your hand? And Gina Weekly. Okay, Th these two ladies are both social workers. I, are there any other social workers in the room? Welcome. All right, so we've got three social workers in the room. There are a lot of doctors up here doing all the talking, but our social workers are the folks that are the front line who are doing this really hard work managing these caseloads that are near impossible, that are incredibly complex with very little resource. These collaborative care teams, I tell you, I've taught, um, I, I worked with CHPW in our AIM Center um, for five years, and I, I developed a curriculum and taught over 115 of our care managers um, you know, actually about 150 of our care managers across Washington State. There's about 115 that are active at all times in our mental health integration program in all of our community health clinics. They are fabulous people, and they tell me time and again they cannot live and do this job without their psychiatry consultants. Um, they really get filled by that consultation that happens. Um, they, they don't feel as much burnout hitting them. They feel like there's someplace to go to talk about these patients. So I, I think it's... Um, I want to point that out to the room. It's interesting that we only have three social workers in the room, and we're talking about this topic because those are the folks that are doing a lot of this work and are going to help us a lot with this work if we're successful at rolling out these programs. So I think we need to include that discipline in a much more powerful way than we do now. Um, okay. We increase intensity as needed. That's that stepped care. Um, you know, and this lowers cost of treatment. Um, and, and has a broad population reach where you can actually screen folks and systematically get them in. Um, it's a bit of a messy design, but I want, I want to give you a sense of who is the team here in collaborative care typically. You've got the patient right at the center. The patient is the most important team member of this whole thing. You've got medical providers. Um, typically, in many of the studies that you guys have heard about today, it's a primary care provider. Um, in labor and industries, it's the attending provider, potentially, who may be a primary care provider, maybe a chiropractor, maybe an OC doc, maybe um, various different roles that attending providers uh, fill in L&I. Um, and there's a care manager who is that, that um, often it's, it's a social work or master's level counseling type person. There have been nurses that have filled it. There have been um, um, even bachelor's level folks in our mental health integration program that have done that role. And then the consultants, is the box looks a bit bigger than Jurgen's box. Um, you know, right now, a lot of the collaborative care programs are psychiatrists. Um, you know, and Dawn Eady's got a study she's just completed now. Uh, that PCORI funded where she added in a psychologist and a pain expert into that consultation group. And so we very much, and Donna's partnered with me on this, thank you so much for agreeing to do that a while back um, on this program. And, and we fully intend to, to have that consultation group be expanded um, because chronic pain is quite complex when it comes to the behavioral interventions that we need to be tracking. And so we want to make sure that those care managers get the support they need. 
Um, L&I comes with a whole slew of other folks that you guys have been hearing about, particularly with COHI as well. So we want to make sure those folks are considered in the team in this new program too, and that that care manager really is a liaison um, to those other roles. Um, you know, as these folks are doing these roles, you've got in this intersection here, the injured worker themselves, the care manager, the, the consultants um, who are advising weekly with that care manager um, uh, what to do with cases and how to step up care, and of course um, the attending provider who's managing things. Um, so this is what the, the care team looks like in an operational collaborative care environment. And in our case, you know, we're really playing around with whether or not this case, this I'm sorry, care manager is going to be co-located in some cases where in a COHI it might really make sense to have a co-located care manager or a remotely located care manager in some of these rural settings um, where we've got doctor's offices that might see one injured worker in a year um, and where it's not going to make sense to have a co-located manager. Um, I want to just give you a sense of the, the breadth of core behavioral interventions potentially that these care managers do. Um, it, there's lots of them. You can read them all up here. There is also um, growing uh, strategies that, that we're developing um, around trying to teach core elements of this type of psychotherapy because there are certain strategies we use across these skill sets um, that are the same. Um, but there are lots of approaches, and, and this is the bag of tools that we want care managers to have. And these tools all really map in, into the circle of behavioral interventions to, when it comes to chronic pain, all of these potential psychosocial risk and symptom factors that you see up here. And it's really, this is how complex this is. This care manager is supposed to take all of those behavioral interventions and figure out how to target these kinds of risks um, floating around up there. And so you can see why, even if, if this care manager is incredibly skilled, at figuring out how to do this, it still helps to talk with somebody every week to figure out how to do some of these cases, um, just to even get other ideas as you're entrenched in doing it. Um, we need to make sure, especially I put a couple of little bubble call-outs here, that they understand how to do pain self-management strategies that many have talked about today already, um, and that medication management piece is really key. All right, so an episode of chronic pain um, and behavioral health sort of looks like this. This is the anatomy that you see. Um, you know, we're really targeting to keep this brief. You know, and to Doug's point, it's really hard to roll out a lot of psychotherapy um, with a whole lot of sessions that are all an hour long. Usually a care management session is about 30 minutes, maybe 45 if you're lucky. There's a lot of case management that happens in there as well around housing, et cetera, or resources that have to get addressed in addition to doing a brief intervention. Um, and we're targeting an episode of care being about two to six months. You know, so how many touches are you going get, to gonna get on that patient in that short amount of time? Um, so this is really tricky business. And all along the way, we're, of course, measuring things. So the care manager is actually um, giving out symptom screeners along the way to make sure that we can see just what are the symptoms as they're um, going through. Um, I'm going to skip this uh, it just because I only have a couple minutes left, is talk through what some of the challenges are. Um, you know, that, that I wanted to just drive home today. Gary invited me to, to go ahead and, and brainstorm a few up here for you guys of what are the challenges that I've seen and all the experience that I've had um, with collaborative care. And I think, you know, there are a few that, that are very specific to LNI as we deploy this particular program. One is, you know, remote versus co-located deployment of care managers. How do you do that well? Nobody really knows the answer to that yet. How do we get those providers, those attending providers, or those primary care providers engaged with a care manager that's remote that they've never met before? And how do we fund these things? Um, integration with existing care across numerous settings. Um, with small populations of injured workers. This is very different than the Mental Health Integration Program or the VA or other programs that have a captured population in a clinic. We don't have that in labor and industries. We have tiny little uh, speckles of the population all over a massive amount of clinics. Um, how do we sustain this workforce um, over time in terms of, of having the skills that they need? So, you know, University of Washington and psychiatry, we've been developing a lot of training programs on how to do this. I'm getting to stop. Can I go an extra minute? Okay. Um, so, so doing this ongoing training and who's going to fund that and who's going to support that's a problem and how do we feed that pipeline earlier into the training programs when people are getting degreed even um, has still not happened yet. So we're doing a lot of remodeling of the airplane in flight. Um, getting the right data, you need to have a tracking solution of some kind and it can be as simple as an Excel spreadsheet, um, but you need to have the right data that you track over time and that can be really hard to do. Um, Going across settings is also um, quite difficult in this situation where we've got, in addition to all of the complex medical systems, in, we have LNI as well, which has a whole other set. 
Um, a couple of ones that I didn't mention on here, there are comorbidities that are often hidden linchpins to this. And David knows I say this all the time, for example, with PTSD, right? You know, if we've got chronic pain, depending on the study you look at, there's a 20 to 50% overlap in PTSD and chronic pain. Um, I have, have done first-time diagnosis of PTSD numerous times in the pain clinic. People have had PTSD for years, um, and we treat that, and all of a sudden, you know, they flourish, right? So we need to be thinking about that, and how can we address those? Um, I think the last piece are just some concrete recommendations I've got. Um, you know, where I think we need to really think forward in whatever new programs we're going to put out there is training, training, training. Please don't forget that part. You know, training is something that has to go on and on over time. You can train the first folks, but then you're going to get turnover in staff. How are you going to train them again? And how are you going to keep them trained? And who's going to fund that? Um, so we need to make sure we can do that. Work directly with the clinical care setting champions so that we can figure out what do they need um, so we can do this together and not be a patriarchal in telling them what they have to do. Start simple, Excel spreadsheets to track data, learn along the way before you invest in big, giant, complicated systems. I'm also a biomedical informaticist. Trust me on that. Um, and then try to avoid, um, and this is my last point, I'll just say, and Leah's heard me say this numerous times, can we not be so specific to one payer, one plan? Can we work together on this? Because I think all of our payers in our state want to do this.